The problem with the Rolling Stone magazine. There is something about a voice that's personal, not unlike the particular odor or shape of a given human body. Someone through belly, hammered into form by the throat, given propulsion by bellows of lungs, teased into final form by tongue and lips. A vocal is a kind of audible kiss, a blurted confession, a sole burp you really can't keep from issuing as you make your way through the material world. How helplessly candid. How appalling. For me, Bob Dylan and Patti Smith, just to mention two, are superb singers by any measure I could ever care about. Expressivity, surprise, soul, grain, interpretive wit, angle of vision. Those two folks, a handful of others. Their soul burps are, for me, the soul burps of the gods. The beauty of the singer's voice touches us in a place that's as personal as the place from which that voice has issued. If one of the weird things about singers is the ecstasy of surrender they inspire, another weird thing is the debunking response a singer can arouse once we've recovered our senses. It's as if they've fooled us into loving them, diddled our hard wiring, located a vulnerability we thought we'd long ago armored over. Falling in love with a singer is like being a teenager every time it happens. This is an excerpt from Jonathan Latham's introduction to the greatest singers of all time feature in the November 27, 2008 issue of Rolling Stone, available in the digital archive. A panel of 179 experts ranked the vocalists. And this is a video analysis brought together by a 15-year-old music enthusiast, which by no means is a music connoisseur, but by all means is an individual with basic auditory training and perfectly functioning hearing organs. What this particular item is to do with is my failing to understand one of what is considered the Rolling Stone magazine's major columns. Rankings. And, to be more specific, rankings with respect to the magazine's base subject. Music. Rankings on decade hits, musicians, dancers, and so on and so forth. Detailed articles embellished with beautifully put together language demonstrating the alleged nature and arguability of each given pick. As I stated above, I don't quite understand the criteria these picks or rankings could be based on. Maybe this is why the purpose of this video is to contest one of the world's biggest publishing agent's actions, after all. Long story short, this publication turned out to be one of the magazine's most iconic articles. Quite clearly, 179 considerate and meticulous critics carefully studied their stack of cards and played their most diligent anti as regards whom they believe to be the best vocal performers our planet has been graced with in contemporary music. Underline, personally believe. To back up what I am trying to enunciate, let me give you the position some of the most widely recognized vocalists had been distributed. At 79, we have Mariah Carey. At 58, there's Christina Aguilera. At 47, we have Jim Morrison. Then at 45, there's Kurt Cobain. At 34, we have Whitney Houston. At 30, there's Prince. At 29, we have Nina Simone. At 25, Michael Jackson. At 18, there's Freddie Mercury. Then at number 16, we have Mick Jagger. At 11, we have Paul McCartney. Then James Brown is placed at number 10. At number 7, we have Bob Dylan. Then at 5, there's John Lennon. And finally, for number 3, I have chosen Elvis Presley. Evidently, it is at least prominent that given the absence of absolute voice manipulating softwares back in the day, these vocalists qualify as regards singing their studio tracks with their own genuine voices. To be clear, these are also the musical artists from which I have 
over the years, obtain the most of, and yet I believe the rankings suffice for me to pass a judgment on this entire list. I consider it to be inaccurate. As a parenthesis, I think it is a given that any verdict should be published under condition that the contender knows a couple of things as regards what they're talking about. Consequently, the artists I chose are the artists I have some cross-examined knowledge on. So, my judgment. Above all, the magazine doesn't even list its precise criteria on how they settled on the artist's positions. Apart from the fact that most musicians or vocalists appearing on this list are relatively well known, while there are less contemporary individuals with distinctively stronger vocal capacities the Rolling Stone critics should be aware of, I would say that this list may as well be based on personal preference. Most of the vocal profiles accompanying an artist's rank pertain to them delivering a certain type of emotion through their performances which is arguably extremely subjective. Let me phrase some questions. Isn't the registration of emotion variable from person to person? Is the emotion expressed in a vocal performance interlinked to its actual quality anyway? Could they consequently go screaming on a stage like Yoko Ono and be awarded because of having expressed animalistic emotion in its purest form? Is there even a standard scale on how one could scientifically rate emotion? So, let me explain. Bob Dylan, in this list, he is among the top 10 of all time best vocalists. He is a poet, namely a fantastic poet, an honourable musician. But is he really a good vocalist? The editor of this critique perceives the emotional quality of his voice to be unique. To many others, however, it could just fall really flat to the ears, see me. Does this mean the masses could be right? Or could a critic's trained perception hold more water? As I said, emotion should not be a ranking agent. It is extremely subjective. He is a poet. However, does this make Bob Dylan a good vocalist? No. His great lyrics may be interlinked with his overall musical value, but not with his individual vocal quality. Dylan has an extremely limited vocal range, as in singing range, though because before you object anything, I can, in fact, distinguish singing from being just able to blurt out high-pitched or low-pitched sounds. Bob Dylan's singing lacks melody. If we break it down, there is no head, no chest voice, vibrato, vocal runs, anything of conceivable quality to rate. As a vocalist, Dylan flat mutters his lyrics. He almost raps them. There is no complexity or condenser in what he enunciates. The artist doesn't hold any vocal value of some kind, operatic, bass, and so on and so forth. He is not distinguished as a supreme voice, but merely a great poet for which, objectively speaking, an a cappella sample should do for most of us to agree on. So, what places him above Freddie Mercury, Prince and Michael Jackson? Were we to question actual technical skill, I don't think the editors of the Rolling Stone magazine would be able to properly justify their choice. Or Lennon. On pure vocal level, he does not hold a candle to women like Mariah or Whitney either. What promoted him to that rank though? It is pretty clear that, although a better vocalist than Dylan and with definitely more admirable vocal highlights than him, he lacks what the artists mentioned above have. Runs, power, stamina and holding notes, a perfect tone that which per se Mariah may or may have had. She has lost 
some of her power at this point. So then you may justifiably point out that Michael Jackson had subjected himself to excessive lip singing. Does this, however, make their prime versions any less viable than they may have been? No. Let me remind you though, even if we adduce this argument, that Lennon passed away at just 40. His last known performance was known to have happened while he was still in his mid-thirties and in no way was it or had it ever been, for the matter, as demanding as Whitney's or Prince's or Michael's. And yet again, yes, Lennon and Dylan may have been musical revolvers, but this list regards solely vocal qualities and nothing else, which apparently many have been failing to distinguish. This is why I am not passing any judgment on Elvis' position per se, which I consider a truly overrated musical artist on the whole, but definitely worthy of being bestowed with respect to his vocals. His pitch was perfect. He held great tone. His embellishments were rich and immaculate. His leading range, namely baritone, lacked any distinct flaws, and so did his lighter trembles. Elvis was an admirable vocalist. He gets a fair ranking, although given the Rolling Stone magazine's previous rankings, I'd say he's mostly placed on number three, based on preference, rather than actual vocal volume. These people are supposed to be professional music critics on Rolling Stone, right? So is there something wrong with my simplistic perspective? Or should someone like Bob Dylan not have eliminated Whitney Houston, whose voice was of near perfect features? Or take John Lennon's yet again greatest vocal performances, he's ranked at number 5, I remind you. Lennon gave us Anna, Mr. Moonlight, so many great tunes, sure, but still and yet again, is his thoroughly praised characteristic stand by me monotone harshness really superior to Prince's flowing and blooming smoothness in Purple Rain? Then there's Jackson at lower number 25, who delivered Who's Loving You at the age of 10. Then he delivered the amazing Earth Song. It just isn't working. Or James Hetfield, the frontman of Metallica. How did Mick Jagger end up outdoing his crystal clear vocal status and even getting the 16th spot while well, Hetfield hasn't even arrogated anything in there? In retrospect, apparently, the rankings have been brought together based on the popularity of a name, the editor's personal favoritism and any criteria on the artist's overall musical value, except for pure, isolated singing qualities. There is personal perspective which may be affecting each one of us up to a certain point, but where is the line between it and objectiveness when it comes to serious cooperative professionalism? Where is it? What I phrased above, along with the bulletins I believe are eligible as vocal rating coordinates are technically and mathematically perfectly acceptable. Emotion, on the other hand, as I said, is subjective, both to its presence and quality, so I do not consider it to be a matter of discussion for the time being. And rough as it may seem, art sometimes is more of a mathematical equation than a drug-induced cosmic incidence. Having briefly analyzed my views on this article now, I have essentially synopsized the gist of the Rolling Stone magazine's catalogue of ratings which, for the major part, develop themselves on said list axes. Now you, also having my blueprint view as a base of evaluation, can get to study a few more credential articles that further prove my point here 
and pass on an objective judgment yourselves. The links to the website's lists, the aforementioned article and another interesting publication I am going to cite just now are all available in the description. My final verdict. It's either that, first of all, before developing their lists, the Rolling Stones should be clarifying exactly what criteria they are basing them on. A definite title should be a correct match to what actually is being ranked per se. You cannot just rate the best lyrics on a song in correspondence to its dance performance or Billboard Top 100 success, or, in this case, name an article Top 100 Best Singers and not incorporate an editor's personal picks specification, at least as a subtitle. On any other aspect of the magazine, I cannot be absolute, as I am not even a subscriber to its entire publishing schedule. Yeah, I am not even a first world citizen. It's just, you know, the thing that the Rolling Stone is basically designated as the Usain Bolt of music magazines quite importantly for having delivered music articles of humongous quality over the past decades. Consequently, if its listings are to be on the same altar as the rest of its content, given that the entire world's perception of artists holds on to them, then their value of cogent structure and elaboration should correspond, you know, with one another, as regards the things mentioned above. Fun fact! Did you know that experiments have shown that people can tell plunk from Grand Cru? Now, one US winemaker claims that even experts can judge wine accurately. What's the science behind the taste? So does a backed up Guardian essay claim. Take a look yourselves.